Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. Hide and Seek by Fyodor Saligub. I, everything in Lelechka's nursery was bright, pretty, and cheerful. Lelechka's sweet voice charmed her mother. Lelechka was a delightful child. There was no other such child, there never had been, and there never would be. Lelechka's mother, Serafima Alexandrovna, was sure of that. Lelechka's eyes were dark and large, her cheeks were rosy, her lips were made for kisses and for laughter. But it was not these charms in Lelechka that gave her mother the keenest joy. Lelechka was her mother's only child. That was why every movement of Lelechka's bewitched her mother. It was great bliss to hold Lelechka on her knees and to fondle her, to feel the little girl in her arms a thing as lively and as bright as a little bird. To tell the truth, Serafima Alexandrovna felt happy only in the nursery. She felt cold with her husband. Perhaps it was because he himself loved the cold he loved to drink cold water, and to breathe cold air. He was always fresh and cool, with a frigid smile, and wherever he passed cold currents seemed to move in the air. The Nesseltievs, Sergei Modestovich and Serafima Alexandrovna, had married without love or calculation, because it was the accepted thing. He was a young man of thirty-five, she a young woman of twenty-five, both were of the same circle and well brought up, he was expected to take a wife, and the time had come for her to take a husband. It even seemed to Serafima Alexandrovna that she was in love with her future husband, and this made her happy. He looked handsome and well-bred, his intelligent grey eyes always preserved a dignified expression, and he fulfilled his obligations of a fiancé with irreproachable gentleness. The bride was also good-looking, she was a tall, dark-eyed, dark-haired girl, somewhat timid but very tactful. He was not after her dowry, though it pleased him to know that she had something. He had connections, and his wife came of good, influential people. This might, at the proper opportunity, prove useful. Always irreproachable and tactful, Nesseltiev got on in his position not so fast that anyone should envy him, nor yet so slow that he should envy anyone else everything came in the proper measure and at the proper time. After their marriage there was nothing in the manner of Sergei Modestovich to suggest anything wrong to his wife. Later, however, when his wife was about to have a child, Sergei Modestovich established connections elsewhere of a light and temporary nature. Serafima Alexandrovna found this out, and, to her own astonishment, was not particularly hurt, she awaited her infant with a restless anticipation that swallowed every other feeling. A little girl was born, Serafima Alexandrovna gave herself up to her. At the beginning she used to tell her husband, with rapture, of all the joyous details of Lelechka's existence. But she soon found that he listened to her without the slightest interest, and only from the habit of politeness. Serafima Alexandrovna drifted farther and farther away from him. She loved her little girl with the unratified passion that other women, deceived in their husbands, show their chance young lovers. Underscore Mamachka underscore, let's play underscore Priatki underscore, hide and seek, cried Lelechka, pronouncing the underscore R underscore like the underscore L underscore, so that the word sounded, Pliatki. This charming inability to speak always made Serafima Alexandrovna smile with tender rapture. Lelechka then ran away, stamping with her plump little legs over the carpets, and hid herself behind the curtains near her bed. Underscore tiu tiu, mamachka, underscore, she cried out in her sweet, laughing voice, as she looked out with a single roguish eye. Where is my baby girl? the mother asked as she looked for Lelechka and made believe that she did not see her. And Lelechka poured out her rippling laughter in her hiding place. Then she came out a little farther, and her mother, as though she had only just caught sight of her, seized her by her little shoulders and exclaimed joyously, Here she is, my Lelechka. Lelechka laughed long and merrily, her head close to her mother's knees, 
and all of her cuddled up between her mother's white hands. Her mother's eyes glowed with passionate emotion. Now, underscore mamachka underscore, you hide, said Lelechka, as she ceased laughing. Her mother went to hide. Lelechka turned away as though not to see, but watched her underscore mamachka underscore stealthily all the time. Mama hid behind the cupboard, and exclaimed, underscore tu tu underscore, baby girl. Lelechka ran round the room and looked into all the corners, making believe, as her mother had done before, that she was seeking though she really knew all the time where her underscore mamachka underscore was standing. Where's my underscore mamachka underscore, asked Lelechka. She's not here, and she's not here, she kept on repeating, as she ran from corner to corner. Her mother stood, with suppressed breathing, her head pressed against the wall, her hair somewhat disarranged. A smile of absolute bliss played on her red lips. The nurse, Fedosia, a good-natured and fine-looking, if somewhat stupid woman, smiled as she looked at her mistress with her characteristic expression, which seemed to say that it was not for her to object to gentlewomen's caprices. She thought to herself, the mother is like a little child herself look how excited she is. Lelechka was getting nearer her mother's corner. Her mother was growing more absorbed every moment by her interest in the game, her heart beat with short quick strokes, and she pressed even closer to the wall, disarranging her hair still more. Lelechka suddenly glanced toward her mother's corner and screamed with joy. I found, oh oh, she cried out loudly and joyously, mispronouncing her words in a way that again made her mother happy. She pulled her mother by her hands to the middle of the room, they were merry and they laughed, and Lelechka again hit her head against her mother's knees, and went on lisping and lisping, without end, her sweet little words, so fascinating yet so awkward. Sergei Modestovich was coming at this moment toward the nursery. Through the half-closed doors he heard the laughter, the joyous outcries, the sound of romping. He entered the nursery, smiling his genial cold smile, he was irreproachably dressed, and he looked fresh and erect, and he spread round him an atmosphere of cleanliness, freshness and coldness. He entered in the midst of the lively game, and he confused them all by his radiant coldness. Even Fedosia felt abashed, now for her mistress, now for herself. Serafima Alexandrovna at once became calm and apparently cold and this mood communicated itself to the little girl, who ceased to laugh, but looked instead, silently and intently, at her father. Sergei Modestovich gave a swift glance round the room. He liked coming here, where everything was beautifully arranged, this was done by Serafima Alexandrovna, who wished to surround her little girl, from her very infancy, only with the loveliest things. Serafima Alexandrovna dressed herself tastefully, this, too, she did for Lelechka, with the same end in view. One thing Sergei Modestovich had not become reconciled to, and this was his wife's almost continuous presence in the nursery. It's just as I thought. I knew that I'd find you here, he said with a derisive and condescending smile. They left the nursery together. As he followed his wife through the door Sergei Modestovich said rather indifferently, in an incidental way, laying no stress on his words, don't you think that it would be well for the little girl if she were sometimes without your company? Merely, you see, that the child should feel its own individuality, he explained in answer to Serafima Alexandrovna's puzzled glance. She's still so little, said Serafima Alexandrovna. In any case, this is but my humble opinion. I don't insist. It's your kingdom there. I'll think it over, his wife answered, smiling, as he did, coldly but genially. Then they began to talk of something else. Two, Nurse Fedosia, sitting in the kitchen that evening, was telling the silent housemaid Daria and the talkative old cook Agathia about the young lady of the house, and how the child loved to play underscore Priatki underscore with her mother she hides her little face, and cries underscore Tayudiu underscore. And the mistress herself is like a little one, added Fedosia, smiling. Agathia listened and shook her head ominously, while her face became grave and reproachful. 
That the mistress does it, well, that's one thing, but that the young lady does it, that's bad. Why? asked Fedosia with curiosity. This expression of curiosity gave her face the look of a wooden, roughly painted doll. Yes, that's bad, repeated Agathia with conviction. Terribly bad. Well, said Fedosia, the ludicrous expression of curiosity on her face becoming more emphatic. She'll hide, and hide, and hide away, said Agathia, in a mysterious whisper, as she looked cautiously toward the door. What are you saying? exclaimed Fedosia, frightened. It's the truth I'm saying, remember my words, Agathia went on with the same assurance and secrecy. It's the surest sign. The old woman had invented this sign, quite suddenly, herself, and she was evidently very proud of it. 3. Lalechka was asleep, and Serafima Alexandrovna was sitting in her own room, thinking with joy and tenderness of Lalechka. Lalechka was in her thoughts, first a sweet, tiny girl, then a sweet, big girl, then again a delightful little girl, and so until the end she remained Mama's little Lalechka. Serafima Alexandrovna did not even notice that Fedosia came up to her and paused before her. Fedosia had a worried, frightened look. Madam, madam, she said quietly, in a trembling voice. Serafima Alexandrovna gave a start. Fedosia's face made her anxious. What is it, Fedosia? she asked with great concern. Is there anything wrong with Lalechka? No, madam, said Fedosia, as she gesticulated with her hands to reassure her mistress and to make her sit down. Lalechka is asleep, may God be with her. Only I'd like to say something you see Lalechka is always hiding herself that's not good. Fedosia looked at her mistress with fixed eyes, which had grown round from fright. Why not good, asked Serafima Alexandrovna, with vexation, succumbing involuntarily to vague fears. I can't tell you how bad it is, said Fedosia, and her face expressed the most decided confidence. Please speak in a sensible way, observed Serafima Alexandrovna dryly. I understand nothing of what you are saying. You see, madam, it's a kind of omen, explained Fedosia abruptly, in a shamefaced way. Nonsense, said Serafima Alexandrovna. She did not wish to hear any further as to the sort of omen it was, and what it foreboded. But, somehow, a sense of fear and of sadness crept into her mood, and it was humiliating to feel that an absurd tale should disturb her beloved fancies, and should agitate her so deeply. Of course I know that gentlefolk don't believe in omens, but it's a bad omen, madam, Fedosia went on in a doleful voice, the young lady will hide, and hide. Suddenly she burst into tears, sobbing out loudly, she'll hide, and hide, and hide away, angelic little soul, in a damp grave, she continued, as she wiped her tears with her apron and blew her nose. Who told you all this? asked Serafima Alexandrovna in an austere low voice. Agathia says so, madam, answered Fedosia, it's she that knows. Knows, exclaimed Serafima Alexandrovna in irritation, as though she wished to protect herself somehow from this sudden anxiety. What nonsense! Please don't come to me with any such notions in the future. Now you may go. Fedosia, dejected, her feelings hurt, left her mistress. What nonsense! As though Lalechka could die, thought Serafima Alexandrovna to herself, trying to conquer the feeling of coldness and fear which took possession of her at the thought of the possible death of Lalechka. Serafima Alexandrovna, upon reflection, attributed these women's beliefs in omens to ignorance. She saw clearly that there could be no possible connection between a child's quite ordinary diversion and the continuation of the child's life. She made a special effort that evening to occupy her mind with other matters, but her thoughts returned involuntarily to the fact that Lalechka loved to hide herself. When Lalechka was still quite small, and had learned to distinguish between her mother and her nurse, she sometimes, sitting in her nurse's arms, made a sudden roguish grimace, and hid her laughing face in the nurse's shoulder. 
then she would look out with a sly glance. Of late, in those rare moments of the mistress' absence from the nursery, Fedosia had again taught Lelechka to hide, and when Lelechka's mother, on coming in, saw how lovely the child looked when she was hiding, she herself began to play hide and seek with her tiny daughter. 4. The next day Serafima Alexandrovna, absorbed in her joyous cares for Lelechka, had forgotten Fedosia's words of the day before. But when she returned to the nursery, after having ordered the dinner, and she heard Lelechka suddenly cry underscore, tiu tiu. Underscore from under the table, a feeling of fear suddenly took hold of her. Though she reproached herself at once for this unfounded, superstitious dread, nevertheless she could not enter wholeheartedly into the spirit of Lelechka's favorite game, and she tried to divert Lelechka's attention to something else. Lelechka was a lovely and obedient child. She eagerly complied with her mother's new wishes. But as she had got into the habit of hiding from her mother in some corner, and of crying out underscore, tiu tiu. Underscore so even that day she returned more than once to the game. Serafima Alexandrovna tried desperately to amuse Lelechka. This was not so easy because restless, threatening thoughts obtruded themselves constantly. Why does Lelechka keep on recalling the underscore tiu tiu underscore? Why does she not get tired of the same thing of eternally closing her eyes, and of hiding her face? Perhaps, thought Serafima Alexandrovna, she is not as strongly drawn to the world as other children, who are attracted by many things. If this is so, is it not a sign of organic weakness? Is it not a germ of the unconscious non-desire to live? Serafima Alexandrovna was tormented by presentiments. She felt ashamed of herself for ceasing to play hide-and-seek with Lelechka before Fedosia. But this game had become agonizing to her, all the more agonizing because she had a real desire to play it, and because something drew her very strongly to hide herself from Lelechka and to seek out the hiding child. Serafima Alexandrovna herself began the game once or twice, though she played it with a heavy heart. She suffered as though committing an evil deed with full consciousness. It was a sad day for Serafima Alexandrovna. V. Lelechka was about to fall asleep. No sooner had she climbed into her little bed, protected by a network on all sides, than her eyes began to close from fatigue. Her mother covered her with a blue blanket. Lelechka drew her sweet little hands from under the blanket and stretched them out to embrace her mother. Her mother bent down. Lelechka, with a tender expression on her sleepy face, kissed her mother and let her head fall on the pillow. As her hands hid themselves under the blanket Lelechka whispered, the hands underscore tiu tiu, underscore, the mother's heart seemed to stop Lelechka lay there so small, so frail, so quiet. Lelechka smiled gently, closed her eyes and said quietly, the eyes underscore tiu tiu, underscore, then even more quietly, Lelechka underscore tiu tiu, underscore, with these words she fell asleep, her face pressing the pillow. She seemed so small and so frail under the blanket that covered her. Her mother looked at her with sad eyes. Serafima Alexandrovna remained standing over Lelechka's bed a long while, and she kept looking at Lelechka with tenderness and fear. I'm a mother, is it possible that I shouldn't be able to protect her, she thought, as she imagined the various ills that might befall Lelechka. She prayed long that night, but the prayer did not relieve her sadness. 6. Several days passed. Lelechka caught cold. The fever came upon her at night. When Serafima Alexandrovna, awakened by Fedosia, came to Lelechka and saw her looking so hot, so restless, and so tormented, she instantly recalled the evil omen, and a hopeless despair took possession of her from the first moments. A doctor was called, and everything was done that is usual on such occasions but the inevitable happened. Serafima Alexandrovna tried to console herself with the hope that Lelechka would get well, and would again laugh and play yet this seemed to her an unthinkable happiness and Lelechka grew feebler from hour to hour. All simulated tranquility, so as not to frighten Serafima Alexandrovna, 
but their masked faces only made her sad. Nothing made her so unhappy as the reiterations of Fedosia, uttered between sobs, she hid herself and hid herself, our Lelechka. But the thoughts of Serafima Alexandrovna were confused, and she could not quite grasp what was happening. Fever was consuming Lelechka, and there were times when she lost consciousness and spoke in delirium. But when she returned to herself she bore her pain and her fatigue with gentle good nature, she smiled feebly at her underscore mamachka underscore, so that her underscore mamachka underscore should not see how much she suffered. Three days passed, torturing like a nightmare. Lelechka grew quite feeble. She did not know that she was dying. She glanced at her mother with her dimmed eyes, and lisped in a scarcely audible, hoarse voice, underscore tiu tiu, mamachka, underscore make underscore tiu tiu, mamachka, underscore, Serafima Alexandrovna hid her face behind the curtains near Lelechka's bed. How tragic! Underscore mamachka, underscore, called Lelechka in an almost inaudible voice. Lelechka's mother bent over her, and Lelechka, her vision grown still more dim, saw her mother's pale, despairing face for the last time. A white underscore mamachka underscore, whispered Lelechka. Underscore Mamachka's underscore white face became blurred, and everything grew dark before Lelechka. She caught the edge of the bed cover feebly with her hands and whispered, underscore tiu tiu, underscore, something rattled in her throat, Lelechka opened and again closed her rapidly paling lips, and died. Serafima Alexandrovna was in dumb despair as she left Lelechka, and went out of the room. She met her husband. Lelechka is dead she said in a quiet, dull voice. Sergei Modestovich looked anxiously at her pale face. He was struck by the strange stupor in her formerly animated handsome features. 7. Lelechka was dressed, placed in a little coffin, and carried into the parlor. Serafima Alexandrovna was standing by the coffin and looking dully at her dead child. Sergei Modestovich went to his wife and, consoling her with cold, empty words, tried to draw her away from the coffin. Serafima Alexandrovna smiled. Go away, she said quietly. Lelechka is playing. She'll be up in a minute. Sima, my dear, don't agitate yourself, said Sergei Modestovich in a whisper. You must resign yourself to your fate. She'll be up in a minute persisted Serafima Alexandrovna, her eyes fixed on the dead little girl. Sergei Modestovich looked round him cautiously, he was afraid of the unseemly and of the ridiculous. Sima, don't agitate yourself, he repeated. This would be a miracle, and miracles do not happen in the nineteenth century. No sooner had he said these words than Sergei Modestovich felt their irrelevance to what had happened. He was confused and annoyed. He took his wife by the arm and cautiously led her away from the coffin. She did not oppose him. Her face seemed tranquil and her eyes were dry. She went into the nursery and began to walk round the room, looking into those places where Lelechka used to hide herself. She walked all about the room and bent now and then to look under the table or under the bed and kept on repeating cheerfully. Where is my little one? Where is my Lelechka? After she had walked round the room once she began to make her quest anew. Fedosia, motionless, with dejected face, sat in a corner, and looked frightened at her mistress, then she suddenly burst out sobbing, and she wailed loudly, she hid herself, and hid herself, our Lelechka, our angelic little soul. Serafima Alexandrovna trembled, paused, cast a perplexed look at Fedosia, began to weep, and left the nursery quietly. 8. Sergei Modestovich hurried the funeral. He saw that Serafima Alexandrovna was terribly shocked by her sudden misfortune, and as he feared for her reason he thought she would more readily be diverted and consoled when Lelechka was buried. Next morning Serafima Alexandrovna dressed with particular care for Lelechka. When she entered the parlor there were several people between her and Lelechka. The priest and deacon paced up and down the room, clouds of blue smoke drifted in the air, and there was a smell of incense. 
There was an oppressive feeling of heaviness in Serafima Alexandrovna's head as she approached Lelechka. Lelechka lay there still and pale, and smiled pathetically. Serafima Alexandrovna laid her cheek upon the edge of Lelechka's coffin, and whispered, underscore tu tu underscore, little one. The little one did not reply. Then there was some kind of stir and confusion around Serafima Alexandrovna, strange, unnecessary faces bent over her, someone held her and Lelechka was carried away somewhere. Serafima Alexandrovna stood up erect, sighed in a lost way, smiled, and called loudly, Lelechka. Lelechka was being carried out. The mother threw herself after the coffin with despairing sobs, but she was held back. She sprang behind the door, through which Lelechka had passed, sat down there on the floor, and as she looked through the crevice, she cried out, Lelechka, underscore tu tu, underscore, then she put her head out from behind the door, and began to laugh. Lelechka was quickly carried away from her mother, and those who carried her seemed to run rather than to walk. Dethroned. By I. N. Potapenko. Well? Captain Zarubkin's wife called out impatiently to her husband, rising from the sofa and turning to face him as he entered. He doesn't know anything about it, he replied indifferently, as if the matter were of no interest to him. Then he asked in a business-like tone, nothing for me from the office? Why should I know? Am I your errand boy? How they dilly-dally. If only the package doesn't come too late. It's so important. Idiot. Who's an idiot? You, with your indifference, your stupid egoism. The captain said nothing. He was neither surprised nor insulted. On the contrary, the smile on his face was as though he had received a compliment. These wifely animadversions, probably oft heard, by no means interfered with his domestic peace. It can't be that the man doesn't know when his wife is coming back home, Mrs. Zarubkin continued excitedly. She's written to him every day of the four months that she's been away. The postmaster told me so. Simayanov. Ho, Simayanov. Has anyone from the office been here? I don't know, Your Excellency, came in a loud, clear voice from back of the room. Why don't you know? Where have you been? I went to Abramka, Your Excellency. The tailor again? Yes, Your Excellency, the tailor Abramka. The captain spat in annoyance. And where is Krinka? He went to market, Your Excellency. Was he told to go to market? Yes, Your Excellency. The captain spat again. Why do you keep spitting? Such vulgar manners, his wife cried angrily. You behave at home like a drunken subaltern. You haven't the least consideration for your wife. You are so coarse in your behavior towards me. Do, please, go to your office. Simayanov. Your Excellency. If the package comes, please have it sent back to the office and say I've gone there. And listen. Someone must always be here. I won't have everybody out of the house at the same time. Do you hear? Yes, Your Excellency. The captain put on his cap to go. In the doorway he turned and addressed his wife. Please, Tasia, please don't send all the servants on your errands at the same time. Something important may turn up, and then there's nobody here to attend to it. He went out, and his wife remained reclining in the sofa corner as if his plea were no concern of hers. But scarcely had he left the house, when she called out, Simayanov, come here. Quick. A barefooted unshaven man in dark blue pantaloons and cotton shirt presented himself. His stocky figure and red face made a wholesome appearance. He was the captain's orderly. At your service, Your Excellency. Listen, Simayanov, you don't seem to be stupid. I don't know, Your Excellency. For goodness sake, drop, Your Excellency. I am not your superior officer. Yes, your Excel idiot. 
but the lady's manner toward the servant was far friendlier than toward her husband. Simeonov had it in his power to perform important services for her, while the captain had not come up to her expectations. Listen, Simeonov, how do you and the doctor's men get along together? Are you friendly? Yes, your excellency. Intolerable, cried the lady, jumping up. Stop using that silly title. Can't you speak like a sensible man? Simeonov had been standing in the stiff attitude of attention, with the palms of his hands at the seams of his trousers. Now he suddenly relaxed, and even wiped his nose with his fist. That's the way we are taught to do, he said carelessly, with a clownish grin. The gentlemen, the officers, insist on it. Now, tell me, you are on good terms with the doctor's men? You mean Podmar and Shuchuk? Of course, we're friends. Very well, then go straight to them and try to find out when Mrs. Shalden is expected back. They ought to know. They must be getting things ready against her return cleaning her bedroom and fixing it up. Do you understand? But be careful to find out right. And also be very careful not to let on for whom you are finding it out. Do you understand? Of course, I understand. Well, then, go. But one more thing. Since you're going out, you may as well stop at Abramka's again and tell him to come here right away. You understand? But His Excellency gave me orders to stay at home, said Simeonov, scratching himself behind his ears. Please don't answer back. Just do as I tell you. Go on, now. At your service. And the orderly, impressed by the lady's severe military tone, left the room. Mrs. Zarubkin remained reclining on the sofa for a while. Then she rose and walked up and down the room and finally went to her bedroom, where her two little daughters were playing in their nurse's care. She scolded them a bit and returned to her former place on the couch. Her every movement betrayed great excitement. Tatyana Grigoryevna Zarubkin was one of the most looked up to ladies of the S. Regiment and even of the whole town of CHMYSK, where the regiment was quartered. To be sure, you hardly could say that, outside the regiment, the town could boast any ladies at all. There were very respectable women, decent wives, mothers, daughters and widows of honorable citizens, but they all dressed in cotton and flannel and on high holidays made a show of cheap cashmere gowns over which they wore gay shawls with borders of wonderful arabesques. Their hats and other headgear gave not the faintest evidence of good taste. So they could scarcely be dubbed ladies. They were satisfied to be called women. Each one of them, almost, had the name of her husband's trade or position tacked to her name Mrs. Grocer so-and-so, Mrs. Mayor so-and-so, Mrs. Milliner so-and-so, etc. Genuine underscore ladies underscore in the Russian society sense had never come to the town before the S. Regiment had taken up its quarters there, and it goes without saying that the ladies of the regiment had nothing in common, and therefore no intercourse with, the women of the town. They were so dissimilar that they were like creatures of a different species. There is no disputing that Tatyana Grigoryevna Zarubkin was one of the most looked up to of the ladies. She invariably played the most important part at all the regimental affairs the amateur theatricals, the social evenings, the afternoon teas. If the captain's wife was not to be present, it was a foregone conclusion that the affair would not be a success. The most important point was that Mrs. Zarubkin had the untarnished reputation of being the best dressed of all the ladies. She was always the most distinguished looking at the annual ball. Her gown for the occasion, ordered from Moscow, was always chosen with the greatest regard for her charms and defects, and it was always exquisitely beautiful. A new fashion could not gain admittance to the other ladies of the regiment except by way of the captain's wife. Thanks to her good taste in dressing, the stately blonde was queen at all the balls and in all the salons of CHMYSK. Another advantage of hers was that although she was nearly forty she still looked fresh and youthful, so that the young officers were constantly hovering about her and paying her homage. 
November was a very lively month in the regiment's calendar. It was on the 10th of November that the annual ball took place. The ladies, of course, spent their best efforts in preparation for this event. Needless to say that in these arduous activities, Abramka Stiftik, the ladies' tailor, played a prominent role. He was the one man in CHMYRSK who had any understanding at all for the subtle art of the feminine toilet. Preparations had begun in his shop in August already. Within the last weeks his modest parlor furnished with six shabby chairs placed about a round table, and a fly-specked mirror on the wall the atmosphere heavy with a smell of onions and herring, had been filled from early morning to the evening hours with the most charming and elegant of the fairer sex. There was trying on and discussion of styles and selection of material. It was all very nerve-wracking for the ladies. The only one who had never appeared in this parlor was the captain's wife. That had been a thorn in Abramka's flesh. He had spent days and nights going over in his mind how he could rid this lady of the, in his opinion, wretched habit of ordering her clothes from Moscow. For this ball, however, as she herself had told him, she had not ordered a dress but only material from out of town, from which he deduced that he was to make the gown for her. But there was only one week left before the ball, and still she had not come to him. Abramka was in a state of feverishness. He longed once to make a dress for Mrs. Zarubkin. It would add to his glory. He wanted to prove that he understood his trade just as well as any tailor in Moscow, and that it was quite superfluous for her to order her gowns outside of CHMYRSK. He would come out the triumphant competitor of Moscow. As each day passed and Mrs. Zarubkin did not appear in his shop, his nervousness increased. Finally she ordered a dressing jacket from him but not a word said of a ball gown. What was he to think of it? So, when Simeonov told him that Mrs. Zarubkin was expecting him at her home, it goes without saying that he instantly removed the dozen pins in his mouth, as he was trying on a customer's dress, told one of his assistants to continue with the fitting, and instantly set off to call on the captain's wife. In this case, it was not a question of a mere ball gown but of the acquisition of the best customer in town. Although Abramka wore a silk hat and a suit in keeping with the silk hat, still he was careful not to ring at the front entrance, but always knocked at the back door. At another time when the captain's orderly was not in the house for the captain's orderly also performed the duties of the captain's cook he might have knocked long and loud. On other occasions a cannon might have been shot off right next to Tatyana Grigoryevna's ears and she would not have lifted her fingers to open the door. But now she instantly caught the sound of the modest knocking and opened the back door herself for Abramka. Oh, she cried delightedly. You, Abramka. She really wanted to address him less familiarly, as was more befitting so dignified a man in a silk hat, but everybody called him, Abramka and he would have been very much surprised had he been honored with his full name, Abram Srolovic Stiftik. So she thought it best to address him as the others did. Mr. Abramka was tall and thin. There was always a melancholy expression in his pale face. He had a little stoop, a long and very heavy grayish beard. He had been practicing his profession for thirty years. Ever since his apprenticeship he had been called Abramka, which did not strike him as at all derogatory or unfitting. Even his shingle read, Ladies Taylor, Abramka Stiftik, the most valid proof that he deemed his name immaterial, but that the chief thing to him was his art. As a matter of fact, he had attained, if not perfection in tailoring, yet remarkable skill. To this all the ladies of the S. Regiment could attest with conviction. Abramka removed his silk hat, stepped into the kitchen, and said gravely, with profound feeling, Mrs. Zarubkin, I am entirely at your service. Come into the reception room. I have something very important to speak to you about. Abramka followed in silence. He stepped softly on tiptoe, as if afraid of waking someone. Sit down, Abramka, listen but give me your word of honor, you won't tell anyone. Tatyana Grigoryevna began, reddening a bit. She was ashamed to have to let the tailor Abramka into her secret, 
but since there was no getting around it, she quieted herself and in an instant had regained her ease. I don't know what you are speaking of, Mrs. Zarubkin, Abramka rejoined. He assumed a somewhat injured manner. Have you ever heard of Abramka ever babbling anything out? You certainly know that in my profession you know everybody has some secret to be kept. Oh, you must have misunderstood me, Abramka. What sort of secrets do you mean? Well, one lady is a little bit one-sided, another lady, he pointed to his breast, is not quite full enough, another lady has scrawny arms such things as that have to be covered up or filled out or laced in, so as to look better. That is where our art comes in. But we are in duty bound not to say anything about it. Tatyana Grigoryevna smiled. Well, I can assure you I am all right that way. There is nothing about me that needs to be covered up or filled out. Oh, as if I didn't know that. Everybody knows that Mrs. Zarubkin's figure is perfect, Abramka cried, trying to flatter his new customer. Mrs. Zarubkin laughed and made up her mind to remember, everybody knows that Mrs. Zarubkin's figure is perfect. Then she said, you know that the ball is to take place in a week. Yes, indeed, Mrs. Zarubkin, in only one week, unfortunately, only one week, replied Abramka, sighing. But you remember your promise to make my dress for me for the ball this time? Mrs. Zarubkin, Abramka cried, laying his hand on his heart. Have I said that I was not willing to make it? No, indeed, I said it must be made and made right for Mrs. Zarubkin, it must be better than for anyone else. That's the way I feel about it. Splendid. Just what I wanted to know. But why don't you show me your material? Why don't you say to me, here, Abramka, here is the stuff, make a dress. Abramka would work on it day and night. Ahem, that's just it I can't order it. That is where the trouble comes in. Tell me, Abramka, what is the shortest time you need for making the dress? Listen, the very shortest? Abramka shrugged his shoulders. Well, is a week too much for a ball dress such as you will want? It's got to be sewed, it can't be pasted together, you, yourself, know that, Mrs. Zarubkin. But supposing I order it only three days before the ball? Abramka started. Only three days before the ball? A ball dress? Am I a god, Mrs. Zarubkin? I am nothing but the lady's tailor, Abramka Stiftik. Well, then you are a nice tailor, said Tatyana Grigoryevna, scornfully. In Moscow they made a ball dress for me in two days. Abramka jumped up as if at a shot, and beat his breast. Is that so? Then I say, Mrs. Zarubkin, he cried pathetically, if they made a ball gown for you in Moscow in two days, very well, then I will make a ball gown for you if I must, in one day. I will neither eat nor sleep, and I won't let my help off either for one minute. How does that suit you? Sit down, Abramka, thank you very much. I hope I shall not have to put such a strain on you. It really does not depend upon me, otherwise I should have ordered the dress from you long ago. It doesn't depend upon you? Then upon whom does it depend? Ahem, it depends upon but now, Abramka, remember this is just between you and me it depends upon Mrs. Sheldon. Upon Mrs. Sheldon, the doctor's wife? Why she isn't even here. That's just it. That is why I have to wait. How is it that a clever man like you, Abramka, doesn't grasp the situation? H.M., H.M. Let me see. Abramka racked his brains for a solution of the riddle. How could it be that Mrs. Sheldon, who was away, should have anything to do with Mrs. Zarubkin's order for a gown? No, that passed his comprehension. She certainly will get back in time for the ball, said Mrs. Zarubkin, to give him a cue. Well, yes. And certainly will bring a dress back with her. Certainly. A dress from abroad, something we have never seen here something highly original. Mrs. Zarubkin. Abramka cried, as if a truth of tremendous import had been revealed to him. 
Mrs. Zarubkin, I understand. Why certainly? Yes, but that will be pretty hard. That's just it. Abramka reflected a moment, then said, I assure you, Mrs. Zarubkin, you need not be a bit uneasy. I will make a dress for you that will be just as grand as the one from abroad. I assure you, your dress will be the most elegant one at the ball, just as it always has been. I tell you, my name won't be Abramka Stiftik if his eager asseverations seemed not quite to satisfy the captain's wife. Her mind was not quite set at ease. She interrupted him. But the style, Abramka, the style. You can't possibly guess what the latest fashion is abroad. Why shouldn't I know what the latest fashion is, Mrs. Zarubkin? In Kiev I have a friend who publishes fashion plates. I will telegraph to him, and he will immediately send me pictures of the latest French models. The telegram will cost only 80 cents, Mrs. Zarubkin, and I swear to you I will copy any dress he sends. Mrs. Shalden can't possibly have a dress like that. All very well and good, and that's what we'll do. Still we must wait until Mrs. Shalden comes back. Don't you see, Abramka, I must have exactly the same style that she has? Can't you see, so that nobody can say that she is in the latest fashion? At this point Simeonov entered the room cautiously. He was wearing the oddest-looking jacket and the captain's old boots. His hair was rumpled, and his eyes were shining suspiciously. There was every sign that he had used the renewal of friendship with the doctor's men as a pretext for a booze. I had to stand them some brandy, your excellency, he said saucily, but catching his mistress's threatening look, he lowered his head guiltily. Idiot, she yelled at him, face about. Be off with you to the kitchen. In his befuddlement, Simeonov had not noticed Abramka's presence. Now he became aware of him, faced about and retired to the kitchen sheepishly. What an impolite fellow, said Abramka reproachfully. Oh, you wouldn't believe, said the captain's wife, but instantly followed Simeonov into the kitchen. Simeonov aware of his awful misdemeanor, tried to stand up straight and give a report. She will come back, your excellency, day after tomorrow toward evening. She sent a telegram. Is that true now? I swear it's true. Shuchek saw it himself. All right, very good. You will get something for this. Yes, your excellency. Silence, you goose. Go on, set the table. Abramka remained about ten minutes longer with the captain's wife, and on leaving said, Let me assure you once again, Mrs. Zarubkin, you needn't worry, just select the style, and I will make a gown for you that the best tailor in Paris can't beat. He pressed his hand to his heart in token of his intention to do everything in his power for Mrs. Zarubkin. It was seven o'clock in the evening. Mrs. Shalden and her trunk had arrived hardly half an hour before, yet the captain's wife was already there paying visit, which was a sign of the warm friendship that existed between the two women. They kissed each other and fell to talking. The doctor, a tall man of forty-five, seemed discomfited by the visit, and passed unfriendly side glances at his guest. He had hoped to spend that evening undisturbed with his wife, and he well knew that when the ladies of the regiment came to call upon each other for only a second, it meant a whole evening of listening to idle talk. You wouldn't believe me, dear, how bored I was the whole time you were away, how I longed for you, Natalie Semyonovna. But you probably never gave us a thought. Oh, how can you say anything like that? I was thinking of you every minute, every second. If I hadn't been obliged to finish the cure, should have returned long ago. No matter how beautiful it may be away from home, still the only place to live is among those that are near and dear to you. These were only the preliminary soundings. They lasted with variations for a quarter of an hour. First Mrs. Shalden narrated a few incidents of the trip, then Mrs. Zarubkin gave a report of some of the chief happenings in the life of the regiment. When the conversation was in full swing, and the samovar was singing on the table, and the pancakes were spreading their appetizing odor, 
the captain's wife suddenly cried, I wonder what the fashions are abroad now. I say, you must have feasted your eyes on them. Mrs. Shalden simply replied with a scornful gesture. Other people may like them, but I don't care for them one bit. I am glad we here don't get to see them until a year later. You know, Tatyana Grigoryevna, you sometimes see the ugliest styles. Really? asked the captain's wife eagerly, her eyes gleaming with curiosity. The great moment of complete revelation seemed to have arrived. Perfectly hideous, I tell you. Just imagine, you know how nice the plain skirts were. Then why change them? But no, to be in style now, the skirts have to be draped. Why? It is just a sign of complete lack of imagination. And in Lyons they got out a new kind of silk butt that is still a French secret. Why a secret? The silk is certainly being worn already? Yes, one does see it being worn already, but when it was first manufactured, the greatest secret was made of it. They were afraid the Germans would imitate. You understand? Oh, but what is the latest style? I really can't explain it to you. All I know is, it is something awful. She can't explain. That means she doesn't want to explain. Oh, the cunning one. What a sly look she has in her eyes. So thought the captain's wife. From the very beginning of the conversation, the two warm friends, it need scarcely be said, were mutually distrustful. Each had the conviction that everything the other said was to be taken in the very opposite sense. They were of about the same age, Mrs. Shalden possibly one or two years younger than Mrs. Zerubkin. Mrs. Zerubkin was rather plump, and had heavy light hair. Her appearance was blooming. Mrs. Shalden was slim, though well proportioned. She was a brunette with a pale complexion and large dark eyes. They were two types of beauty very likely to divide the gentlemen of the regiment into two camps of admirers. But women are never content with halves. Mrs. Zerubkin wanted to see all the officers of the regiment at her feet, and so did Mrs. Shalden. It naturally led to great rivalry between the two women, of which they were both conscious, though they always had the friendliest smiles for each other. Mrs. Shalden tried to give a different turn to the conversation. Do you think the ball will be interesting this year? Why should it be interesting, rejoined the captain's wife scornfully. Always the same people, the same old humdrum jogtrot. I suppose the ladies have been besieging our poor Abramka? I really can't tell you. So far as I am concerned, I have scarcely looked at what he made for me. Hmm, how's that? Didn't you order your dress from Moscow again? No. It really does not pay. I am sick of the bother of it all. Why all that trouble? For whom? Our officers don't care a bit how one dresses. They haven't the least taste. Hmm, there's something back of that, thought Mrs. Shalden. The captain's wife continued with apparent indifference, I can guess what a gorgeous dress you had made abroad. Certainly in the latest fashion. I. Mrs. Shalden laughed innocently. How could I get the time during my cure to think of a dress? As a matter of fact, I completely forgot the ball, thought of it at the last moment, and bought the first piece of goods I laid my hands on. Pink? Oh, no. How can you say pink? Light blue, then? You can't call it exactly light blue. It is a very undefined sort of color. I really wouldn't know what to call it. But it certainly must have some sort of a shade. You may believe me or not if you choose, but really I don't know. It's a very indefinite shade. Is it Sura silk? No, I can't bear Sura. It doesn't keep the folds well. I suppose it is crepe de chine. Heavens, no. Crepe de chine is much too expensive for me. Then what can it be? Oh, wait a minute, what underscore is underscore the name of that goods? You know there are so many funny new names now. They don't make any sense. 
Then show me your dress, dearest. Do please show me your dress. Mrs. Sheldon seemed to be highly embarrassed. I am so sorry I can't. It is way down at the bottom of the trunk. There is the trunk. You see yourself I couldn't unpack it now. The trunk, close to the wall, was covered with oil cloth and tied tight with heavy cords. The captain's wife devoured it with her eyes. She would have liked to see through and through it. She had nothing to say in reply, because it certainly was impossible to ask her friend, tired out from her recent journey, to begin to unpack right away and take out all her things just to show her her new dress. Yet she could not tear her eyes away from the trunk. There was a magic in it that held her enthralled. Had she been alone she would have begun to unpack it herself, nor even have asked the help of a servant to undo the knots. Now there was nothing left for her but to turn her eyes sorrowfully away from the fascinating object and take up another topic of conversation to which she would be utterly indifferent. But she couldn't think of anything else to talk about. Mrs. Sheldon must have prepared herself beforehand. She must have suspected something. So now Mrs. Zerubkin pinned her last hope to Abramka's inventiveness. She glanced at the clock. Dear me, she exclaimed, as if surprised at the lateness of the hour. I must be going. I don't want to disturb you any longer either, dearest. You must be very tired. I hope you rest well. She shook hands with Mrs. Sheldon, kissed her and left. Abramka Stiftik had just taken off his coat and was doing some ironing in his shirt sleeves, when a peculiar figure appeared in his shop. It was that of a stocky orderly in a well-worn uniform without buttons and old galoshes instead of boots. His face was gloomy-looking and was covered with a heavy growth of hair. Abramka knew this figure well. It seemed always just to have been awakened from the deepest sleep. Ah, Shuchik, what do you want? Mrs. Sheldon would like you to call upon her, said Shuchik. He behaved as if he had come on a terribly serious mission. Ah, that's so, your lady has come back. I heard about it. You see I am very busy. Still you may tell her I am coming right away. I just want to finish ironing Mrs. Konopotkin's dress. Abramka simply wanted to keep up appearances, as always when he was sent for. But his joy at the summons to Mrs. Sheldon was so great that to the astonishment of his helpers and Shuchik he left immediately. He found Mrs. Sheldon alone. She had not slept well the two nights before and had risen late that morning. Her husband had left long before for the military hospital. She was sitting beside her open trunk taking her things out very carefully. How do you do, Mrs. Sheldon? Welcome back to CHMYRSK. I congratulate you on your happy arrival. Oh, how do you do, Abramka, said Mrs. Sheldon delightedly. We haven't seen each other for a long time, have we? I was rather homesick for you. Oh, Mrs. Sheldon, you must have had a very good time abroad. But what do you need me for? You certainly brought a dress back with you. Abramka always comes in handy, said Mrs. Sheldon jestingly. We ladies of the regiment are quite helpless without Abramka. Take a seat. Abramka seated himself. He felt much more at ease in Mrs. Sheldon's home than in Mrs. Zerubkin's. Mrs. Sheldon did not order her clothes from Moscow. She was a steady customer of his. In this room he had many a time circled about the doctor's wife with a yard measure, pins, chalk and scissors, had kneeled down beside her, raised himself to his feet, bent over again and stood puzzling over some difficult problem of dressmaking how low to cut the dress out at the neck, how long to make the train how wide the hem, and so on. None of the ladies of the regiment ordered as much from him as Mrs. Sheldon. Her grandmother would send her material from Kiev or the doctor would go on a professional trip to Chernigov and always bring some goods back with him, or sometimes her aunt in Voronezh would make her a gift of some silk. Abramka is always ready to serve Mrs. Sheldon first, said the tailor, though seized with a little pang, as if bitten by a guilty conscience. 
Are you sure you are telling the truth? Is Abramka always to be depended upon? Eh, uh, is he? She looked at him searchingly from beneath drooping lids. What a question, rejoined Abramka. His face quivered slightly. His feeling of discomfort was waxing. Has Abramka ever, oh, things can happen. But, all right, never mind. I brought a dress along with me. I had to have it made in a great hurry, and there is just a little more to be done on it. Now if I give you this dress to finish, can I be sure that you positively won't tell another soul how it is made? Mrs. Sheldon, oh, Mrs. Sheldon, said Abramka reproachfully. Nevertheless, the expression of his face was not so reassuring as usual. You give me your word of honor? Certainly. My name isn't Abramka Stiftik if I, well, all right, I will trust you. But be careful. You know of whom you must be careful? Who is that, Mrs. Sheldon? Oh, you know very well whom I mean. No, you needn't put your hand on your heart. She was here to see me yesterday and tried in every way she could to find out how my dress is made. But she couldn't get it out of me. Abramka sighed. Mrs. Sheldon seemed to suspect his betrayal. I am right, am I not? She has not had her dress made yet, has she? She waited to see my dress, didn't she? And she told you to copy the style, didn't she? Mrs. Sheldon asked with honest naivete. But I warn you, Abramka, if you give away the least little thing about my dress, then all is over between you and me. Remember that. Abramka's hand went to his heart again, and the gesture carried the same sense of conviction as of old. Mrs. Sheldon, how can you speak like that? Wait a moment. Mrs. Sheldon left the room. About ten minutes passed during which Abramka had plenty of time to reflect. How could he have given the captain's wife a promise like that so lightly? What was the captain's wife to him as compared with the doctor's wife? Mrs. Zerubkin had never given him a really decent order just a few things for the house and some mending. Supposing he were now to perform this great service for her, would that mean that he could depend upon her for the future? Was any woman to be depended upon? She would wear this dress out and go back to ordering her clothes from Moscow again. But underscore Mrs. Sheldon underscore, she was very different. He could forgive her having brought this one dress along from abroad. What woman in Russia would have refrained, when abroad, from buying a new dress? Mrs. Sheldon would continue to be his steady customer all the same. The door opened. Abramka rose involuntarily, and clasped his hands in astonishment. Well, he exclaimed rapturously, that is a dress, that is my, my. He was so stunned he could find nothing more to say. And how charming Mrs. Sheldon looked in her wonderful gown. Her tall slim figure seemed to have been made for it. What simple yet elegant lines. At first glance you would think it was nothing more than an ordinary house gown, but only at first glance. If you looked at it again, you could tell right away that it met all the requirements of a fancy ball gown. What struck Abramka most was that it had no waistline, that it did not consist of bodice and skirt. That was strange. It was just caught lightly together under the bosom, which it brought out in relief. Draped over the whole was a sort of upper garment of exquisite old rose lace embroidered with large silk flowers, which fell from the shoulders and broadened out in bold superb lines. The dress was cut low and edged with a narrow strip of black down around the bosom, around the bottom of the lace drapery, and around the hem of the skirt. A wonderful fan of feathers to match the down edging gave the finishing touch. Well, how do you like it, Abramka, asked Mrs. Sheldon with a triumphant smile. Glorious, glorious. I haven't the words at my command. What a dress. No, I couldn't make a dress like that. And how beautifully it fits you, as if you had been born in it, Mrs. Sheldon. What do you call the style? Empire. Empire, he queried. Is that a new style? Well, 
well, what people don't think of. Tailors like us might just as well throw our needles and scissors away. Now, listen, Abramka, I wouldn't have shown it to you if there were not this sewing to be done on it. You are the only one who will have seen it before the ball. I am not even letting my husband look at it. Oh, Mrs. Shalden, you can rely upon me as upon a rock. But after the ball may I copy it? Oh, yes, after the ball copy it as much as you please, but not now, not for anything in the world. There were no doubts in Abramka's mind when he left the doctor's house. He had arrived at his decision. That superb creation had conquered him. It would be a piece of audacity on his part, he felt, even to think of imitating such a gown. Why, it was not a gown. It was a dream, a fantastic vision without a bodice, without puffs or frills or tawdry trimmings of any sort. Simplicity itself and yet so chic. Back in his shop he opened the package of fashion plates that had just arrived from Kiev. He turned the pages and stared in astonishment. What was that? Could he trust his eyes? An empire gown. There it was, with the broad voluptuous drapery of lace hanging from the shoulders and the edging of down. Almost exactly the same thing as Mrs. Sheldon's. He glanced up and saw Simayanov outside the window. He had certainly come to fetch him to the captain's wife, who must have ordered him to watch the tailor's movements, and must have learned that he had just been at Mrs. Sheldon's. Simayanov entered and told him his mistress wanted to see him right away. Abramka slammed the fashion magazine shut as if afraid that Simayanov might catch a glimpse of the new empire fashion and give the secret away. I will come immediately, he said crossly. He picked up his fashion plates, put the yard measure in his pocket, rammed his silk hat sorrowfully on his head and set off for the captain's house. He found Mrs. Zarubkin pacing the room excitedly, greeted her, but carefully avoided meeting her eyes. Well, what did you find out? Nothing, Mrs. Zarubkin, said Abramka dejectedly. Unfortunately, I couldn't find out a thing. Idiot. I have no patience with you. Where are the fashion plates? Here, Mrs. Zarubkin. She turned the pages, looked at one picture after the other, and suddenly her eyes shone and her cheeks reddened. Oh, Empire. The very thing. Empire is the very latest. Make this one for me, she cried commandingly. Abramka turned pale. Empire, Mrs. Zarubkin? I can't make that Empire dress for you, he murmured. Why not? asked the captain's wife, giving him a searching look. Because, because I can't. Oh, you can't. You know why you can't. Because that is the style of Mrs. Sheldon's dress. So that is the reliability you boast so about? Great. Mrs. Zarubkin, I will make any other dress you choose, but it is absolutely impossible for me to make this one. I don't need your fashion plates, do you hear me? Get out of here, and don't ever show your face again. Mrs. Zarubkin, I get out of here, repeated the captain's wife, quite beside herself. The poor tailor stuck his yard measure, which he had already taken out, back into his pocket and left. Half an hour later the captain's wife was entering a train for Kiev, carrying a large package which contained material for a dress. The captain had accompanied her to the station with a pucker in his forehead. That was five days before the ball. At the ball two expensive empire gowns stood out conspicuously from among the more or less elegant gowns which had been finished in the shop of Abramka Stiftik, ladies' tailor. The one gown adorned Mrs. Sheldon's figure, the other the figure of the captain's wife. Mrs. Zarubkin had bought her gown ready-made at Kiev, and had returned only two hours before the beginning of the ball. She had scarcely had time to dress. Perhaps it would have been better had she not appeared at this one of the annual balls, had she not taken that fateful trip to Kiev. For in comparison with the make and style of Mrs. Sheldon's dress, which had been brought abroad, hers was like the botched imitation of an amateur. That was evident to everybody, though the captain's wife had her little group of partisans, 
who maintained with exaggerated eagerness that she looked extraordinarily fascinating in her dress and Mrs. Sheldon still could not rival her. But there was no mistaking it, there was little justice in this contention. Everybody knew better, what was worst of all, Mrs. Zerubkin herself knew better. Mrs. Sheldon's triumph was complete. The two ladies gave each other the same friendly smiles as always, but one of them was experiencing the fine disdain and the derision of the conqueror, while the other was burning inside with the furious resentment of a dethroned goddess-goddess of the annual ball. From that time on Abramka cautiously avoided passing the captain's house. The End Thank you for being with us until the end. We hope you had a wonderful time. If you enjoyed our book, please support us by liking and leaving comments. We look forward to seeing you soon with another book. Best regards.